Good morning and welcome today to ICA's online service. Before we dive in, here's a few things that you should know about. As we grow, we are in need of more volunteers. So sign up today using the QR code or by going to icaspy.com slash volunteer and see if there is a ministry that God might be calling you to join. Speaking of volunteers, Christmas is coming and ICA is gearing up for this year's Christmas production. If you would like to help participate in our Christmas celebration, go to our volunteer form and select Christmas production. Then choose an area you might be interested to serve. We need you, so come and join and help make Christmas 2022 our best ever. Okay, that's it for the announcements. Now grab your coffee and your notebook and let's join the service. Hello and welcome to ICA Online. My name is Leighton and I'm part of the team here at ICA and it is my privilege to bring the word to you today. We're in part two of a series that we've just started called Forgotten Histories, where uh, we're going through the book of Genesis, the beginning of it all, and looking at the way in which our lives are a continuation of God's redemptive story from beginning right through to end. And so last week, we were left with this uh, divine promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that one day the offspring of Eve would crush the head of the serpent. It was this picture of the, the final ultimate victory that Jesus will, will deliver as he comes again, and a, a victory that he has already brought about on the cross. But we're left with this uh, picture very quickly in the book of Genesis of, of just how rapidly the situation for humanity has deteriorated. Humanity has departed from the presence of God and the human heart has become corrupt. And so today, the title of the message is Noah and the Flood. We're going to be looking at a, a story that has captured the imagination of not only Christians around the world, but really every, every culture. Just about every culture has uh, some flood narrative that it refers back to. It's, it's not a story that is unique to the biblical narrative. Certainly there are aspects of the biblical story that are, uh, are specific to the Bible, but there are other ancient documents that refer to a flood. There is archaeological evidence that, that supports the, uh, the the presence of a flood in, in ancient history. There is scientific evidence and, and genuine agreement among the scientific community that at some point, something happened. Now, I'm not going to tell you today whether or not this was what uh, caused the dinosaurs to become extinct. I'm not going to uh, uh, tell you whether this was a, a, a global or a, a local or a regional flood. You can debate some of those things yourself in your go group. Uh, that would be a fun conversation. But whatever the size of the flood was, whenever it happened, 
the theological importance, the importance to the story of God of the Noah narrative remains unchanged. And I want to suggest to you that somehow, even in the church, we have domesticated the Noah narrative. You know, we've made it this, this fun story about uh, Mr. Noah and Mrs. Noah who, who they love the animals and they go for a ride on the boat. But can I tell you that this is so much more than that? This is not just a fun story for the kids. This is a story of complete and utter devastation at a level that we cannot begin to fathom. And yet out of it, we have this picture of renewal and hope. Now, just to set the scenes, I'm going to read uh, from Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 to 7. It says, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. The Bible paints a very clear picture. In verse 6, So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, even the birds of the sky. I am sorry that I ever made them. This idea of of God regretting his creation, it's it's a difficult one. We, we almost want to tell God at this point, just calm down, God. Don't overreact. But just note that the text, when we actually read it, doesn't portray God as, as responding in a fit of anger. There's no indication here of, of, of the wrath of God or a depiction of God hurling down thunderbolts. No, God is grieving He's grieving because the creation that he so dearly loved, the creation that he chose to remain intimately involved with, was on a rapid trajectory to its own destruction. And so the flood in this sense was just a a natural recourse to the evil that had already taken over the world. It seems harsh when we we reflect back on what happened, but it in fact wasn't harsh. It was a proportionate response to the pervasiveness of evil. Now, you might have heard the saying that the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And that's what we see here. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. We see the wickedness of the human heart on display. And we see the way in which sin has culminated into this state of total rebellion, total selfishness. But one of the fascinating things we see in in the Noah narrative is that it wasn't just the the totality of human sin and and human's evil. There was also the presence of a a, a spiritual kind of evil here. And some of us, uh, well, all of us find this hard to understand. There is this obscure passage at the beginning of Genesis chapter 6, which references the, the Nephilim. And whoever you you think the Nephilim might be, there are a range of different um, and valid ideas and and theories. You can have a look at this passage yourself. What we do note is that uh, there are spiritual forces of evil at work, even in the Noah narrative and connected to the Noah narrative. Spiritual forces that are on the warpath and that want to amplify and, and reinforce the depravity that is in mankind. We see this curious link to spiritual evil referred to in the New Testament. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19 to 20, it says, Christ went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Paul again acknowledges this this idea of spiritual evil when he says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the, the, the powers and the authorities, the, the rulers of the heavenly realm, the spiritual forces of evil and darkness. And so we have on one hand that the evil of the human heart and we have this, uh, this presence of spiritual evil and, and how they relate to one another is, is in a sense a mystery. 
But the confronting thing we have here is that Jesus himself actually uses the picture of of the wickedness in Noah's generation to describe the wickedness of the world today and the wickedness of the world into which he is going to return. In Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, it reads, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, it doesn't require great imagination to to see that the attitude of this generation today is is similar to the, the attitude of the generation in Noah's time. You know, people will just go about thinking that they're just living their best life and, and everything seems normal. And yet underneath what is holding it all together is just this, this, this evil system. And people are given over to their own uh, ideas of, of self-survival, self-enhancement and, and pleasure and, and wealth. And yet underpinning it all is evil. And yet somehow along this pervasive evil as bad as things have become, we see a family, one family, who chose not to follow the patterns of this world, but to live according to God's ways. We see that God exalts the righteous. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now, what does this mean? Because Finding favor is not just a matter of our our good deeds outweighing our bad deeds. It is not about being the most spiritual person in the room. Finding the favor of God is about walking in obedience to his ways, no matter how countercultural, no matter how excessive, no matter how radical or even backward this might seem. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In verse 9, it says that Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless among the people of his time and he walked faithfully with God. Now, it doesn't say that Noah was perfect. It doesn't say that his righteousness earned him salvation, but he was blameless in the eyes of God. And what we see is that God recognizes and God esteems and God desires blamelessness among his children. He honors that. And so God sets Noah and his family apart. And he continues on in chapter 6, verse 14, and says, So make yourself an ark of cypress wood and make rooms in it and coat it with pitch. Uh, This is a a waterproofing element that was used in, in vessel construction. Coat it with pitch inside and out. And the passage goes on to to list some of the specifications of the ark in, in impressive detail. And I just want to to point out to you that this was an incredibly impressive vessel and was technologically advanced uh, for the time in which it was built. In fact, so great was the size of the ark, particularly for a wooden vessel, that for thousands of years, it is the largest or it was the largest listed vessel in human history right up until the time of the Titanic. That gives us some perspective about the the scale of of the vessel. But this was no cruise ship. It wasn't designed to be a a comfy ride. It's not as if we can say, hey, I would like to go in the boat. And I just want to point out two uh, particular aspects of the vessel that I think are noteworthy. One is that there were no windows in in the ark for them to, to look out as they were at sea. The Bible does say that there were windows, but they were, they were high up in the ark. They were above eye line. And for most of the duration of the voyage, they were actually closed. We know this because Noah needed to send uh, birds out to look for dry land. And he used the birds as his eyes. He couldn't uh, see out of the windows himself. The second point that I wanted to note is that there was no rudder. or or steering wheel on the ship. There was no means of navigation. And in fact, even if there were, it would be pointless because there was nowhere for them to navigate to. 
They were entirely in God's hands. This was an exercise in trusting God. And so I want to put the question to you, would you enter the boat knowing that you had no ability to steer and control the direction of your life? Or are we ready to let God take the reins and let God set the direction in our lives and surrender our desire for control? We read on in chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. This is the first reference to the flood. I'm going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. You were to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Now, I love going to the zoo. And just a little while back, I, I took my family, Grace and I took the kids to, to KBS, to Kebun Binatang Surabaya. And um, I tell you what, most of the animals were alive, so we had a great time, and I love going to the zoo. But I love going home from the zoo too, where I can take a shower and where I can get away from the, the stench of the animals. And we, we like to sanitize the Noah story, but the reality is that for 370 days, it wasn't just 40 days that they were on the ark, for 370 days, they were the zookeepers. Not just uh, cleaning the pens of the dogs and the cats and the rabbits, the elephants the hippos. This was dirty work and they couldn't pay their pambantu to do this. And the point that I'm drawing out here is that the promises of God are not always going to be glamorous. Living up to the standards that God sets for our lives can be tough. And our idea of, of success in the world today is not the idea that God wants us to be holding on to. Sometimes God wants us to get our hands dirty. And yet through it all, incredibly, Noah remains obedient. Genesis 6 verse 22 says, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Again in Genesis 7 verse 5, and Noah did all the Lord commanded him. We see this, this pattern of Noah's obedience to God's commands. What made Noah righteous? It was his obedience to God. This is clearly important to God and God wants us to be obedient to him. And then it says something very interesting in, in Genesis 7 verses 16. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. Noah was completely shut in. The windows were closed. He couldn't see out. It was dark. And as I read this, uh, the question came, came to my own heart. Has there been a time where God shut you in? And sometimes we might, we might feel enclosed. We might feel like we have been limited in some way, but God could actually be uh, protecting us from something, from a particular situation. And so what might look like darkness, what might look like uh, claustrophobia is potentially God's way of keeping us from something that we're not yet ready to handle. And so don't be discouraged if for a time God has kept you from something. He has limited you because you don't know what he could be preparing you for. And yet sometimes in, in situations where God might be wanting to shut us in, we, we push back and we, we want to keep the, the window or the door wedged open and we don't want to come to this point of total surrender. But we see that God demanded nothing less of Noah and his family than total surrender. Now, Noah's deliverance and, and the deliverance of his family goes to this idea of God saving his remnant. There's a, a famous and well-known verse in the Bible that says that only the remnant will be saved. And Noah and his family were, were a kind of remnant. Now, in the Bible, remnants, remnants are these uh, often small, contained discipleship communities that 
Uh, we see throughout Scripture who refuse to bow down to the cultures of the day and instead live out lives with a deep hunger and a deep reverence for God. Chapter 7, verse 23 says, Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. Noah and his family were a remnant community. Israel, throughout the history of the Israelite people, have understood themselves as a remnant community. It's an important concept in the Bible. And I want to suggest to you that, that God is setting aside the remnant in his church today. God is setting aside a people who will model their lives after Jesus in a wicked generation. God is setting aside a people who will exist within the system but who are not bound by it, a people who allow this, this separation to uh, cause them to see the myths and the blind spots of their own culture and to reject these in order to find a greater dependency on God. God is setting aside a people whose faith will burn red hot even when the society and the culture and the people around them are living lives that are cooling down and fizzling out. He wants people who burn red hot with faith for him. Because there are no stowaways in the kingdom of God. There's no free ride. There are no lucky survivors. There is only the grace of God. And by the grace of God, time and time again, we see that God preserves his remnant. Now, I mentioned earlier that Noah was on the ark for 370 days. If you thought your lockdown was tough, Try being locked down in the dark in a smelly rocking boat where your greatest conversation partner is potentially a monkey. You don't have your phone. You don't have the internet. You don't have games. All you can do is wait on God. And Noah waited on God. In chapter 8, verse 6, it says that after 40 days, this is 40 days from the rain stopping, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark. And this amazes me because as someone who, who likes to control and as someone who, who likes certainty, if I was in the ark, I just imagined that the moment I heard the rain stop, I would be opening the window. I would want to see what is going on. And I wonder if this played on, on Noah's mind day after day, the rain had stopped and he's thinking to himself, should I take a peek? Should I take a peek? But he waits on God. He chooses faith over what little comfort he has left in his life. We read on in chapter 8, verses 13 to 14. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, this is 11 months in, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. Now, surely this is the moment when Noah can get out of the ark. The surface is dry. He has removed the covering. God has given him a glimpse into his future, a glimpse of what he will step into. And yet we see that for two more months, Noah remains on the ark. He waits on God. In verse 14, by the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. And in verse 16, Finally, God says to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. You know, sometimes we want to run out on our own and run after a glimpse when God has not finished the work that he needs to do, whether this is in our own hearts or whether this is in the situation around us. Don't move ahead of God's will. How we wish to, to open the window and how we wish to remove the covering according to our own timing. But maybe God is saying to you in your situation, wait. Now, God remembers Noah. This is an important um, concept that we see uh, right throughout the Bible. God remembers his people. In chapter 8, verse 1, it says, but God remembered Noah. And all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. 
God remembers us. He remembers the plight of his people. He will never leave or forsake you. And he is bound by the covenant, bound by covenant to those who are in Christ Jesus and those who walk according to his ways. And it says, God made a wind blow over the earth. And this verse actually echoes uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where the Spirit of God is hovering over the deep. In the creation story, it's interesting, the word wind in Hebrew, ruach, is the same uh, word for breath, and it is the same word for spirit. And so in the Noah account, we have this God-sent wind, the ruach, the Spirit of God moving upon the waters once more. Just think that the Spirit of God was amidst the chaos and destruction, causing the waters to recede in a picture of Genesis 1 verse 2. The same Spirit who is in his church today. And so just as Noah was led out of the waters by the Spirit of God, we need to allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit of God, to find ourselves regularly in his presence. And yes, good doctrine is is incredibly important. We need good doctrine. And yes, living upright lives, that that is important to God and we need to live lives that honor Him. But can I tell you, with all of these things, over and above all of these things, we need to find ourselves regularly in the presence of God. And that is exactly what Noah did as he came out of the ark. Noah responds to God in worship. Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 to 21 says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. This was the greatest barbecue in human history. So great was the smell. It says in verse 21, The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans. And even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, never again will I destroy living creatures as I have done. Now, two very significant things are happening here that I see. The first is the importance of sacrifice in God's plan for salvation. Now, from the earliest stories of the Bible, we see the necessity of atonement this idea that the shedding of blood is, is necessary to cover us from the judgment that our, our brokenness actually truly deserves. And the staggering thing is that one of every kind of sacrificial uh, animal was, was sacrificed. And yet, even though so many animals were, were put on the altar, this was not enough to set humanity free from the brokenness of their sin. No matter how great the effort on our part, it is never enough. It is only through the sacrifice of Jesus, God's very son, that we have true and lasting redemption, that we have unity with God. The second noteworthy thing that I see in, in this passage is that God responds to our worship. He smelt the, the pleasing aroma and it moved his heart. And as it moved his heart, God entered into a covenant with his people. Never underestimate the spiritual power of worship. God moved upon Noah's worship and he moves upon our worship today. And so regularly find yourselves in the presence of God. You don't need a band to do this. You don't need a smoke machine to do this. You don't need to know how to play music to do this. Find yourself in God's presence. Ask him, God, be present with me and spend time reflecting upon his goodness in worship and in prayer. Invite him into your lives. God moves. He brings his presence as we seek him. Now we see a covenant here. And this is the first recorded covenant in the Bible. A covenant is a, a promise that, that carries with it obligations, uh, sometimes just on one party, sometimes on both parties. It's, it's um, similar in some ways to a legal contract in, in today's uh, world. God says in chapter 9, verse 11 to 13, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you. 
a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Now, this was a covenant of of mercy. It was God showing his kindness to humanity. It was not a covenant that was deserved. God didn't need to do this, but out of his desire to see his people who were created in his image walk again according to their div- according to their divine purpose and walk intimately with him, he, he gave them a covenant. And this idea of a, a divine purpose is something that we looked at last week, that uh, God said to Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, his purpose for them was to rule and he said to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. And this divine purpose, even with Uh, the the depravity and the the sinfulness of the human heart, this divine purpose continues on throughout the Noah narrative. We see in chapter 8, verse 17, it says, be fruitful and multiply. And then we skip along to chapter 9, verse 1, be fruitful and multiply. And then we go on to Genesis chapter 9, verse 7, be fruitful and multiply. There is a repetition happening here and a clear thing theme, and that is the continuity of God's commands. And we're going to be looking at this uh, more next week. But uh, just as I I begin to land this, I want to suggest to you that Noah was saved from the water, but he was also saved by the water. And we can see easily enough the way that he was saved from the water. Out of God's grace to him, he was uh, placed on the ark. He was given a forewarning so that he could be uh, kept from the destruction that ensued. But Noah was also saved by the water. The, The death that the waters represent also brought about new life. And in a sense, Noah passed through this death itself. He passed through the destruction of Uh, the the known world in order for renewal to occur. He was spared the consequences of judgment, but it was also uh, the judgment that brought about his saving from the evil of the world. And this is the situation that we find ourselves in when we follow Jesus. We're spared the consequences of judgment because Christ took these upon himself. And yet through the judgment of God, we are also saved. We are dead to the world and we are made alive in Christ. And the point that I'm trying to get at here is that the judgment we see in the Noah narrative is a a picture and a foreshadowing of the coming judgment of the second coming of Christ. 2 Peter 2, verses 5 to 9 says, if he, if God did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness and seven others, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. God showed us in the Noah narrative that he knows what he is doing. He knows how to save his remnant. He is the master of salvage operations and already he has entered the wreckage to save the lives of those whose hearts are for him. But God also makes it clear that the unrighteous will also be held to account. Maybe this is why the author of Proverbs wrote in in chapter 21, verse 15, that justice is a joy to the godly, but it terrifies evildoers. And so where does this leave us? How should we live in light of all of this? Peter, who who draws upon uh, the flood as an example uh, in multiple times throughout his letters, Peter ponders this question of how we should live. 2 Peter 3, verses 11 to 12 says, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, uh, he uses the flood as an example, what kind of people ought we to be? We know that... uh, people in the time of the flood uh, were eating, drinking, and being merry, that they were giving themselves over to marriage, uh, just living their lives. What sort of life should we live? Peter says, you ought to live holy and godly lives, 
as you look forward to the day of God and as you speed its coming. In other words, God's desire is that we relentlessly pursue him and carry out his will in every area of our lives. We live ready, but we also live joyfully, looking forward to the day of the coming of Christ. You know, sometimes I, I, I wonder if we begin to, to fear because we've just uh, fed into this narrative of, of judgment, but we are to desire as God's people the judgment that is coming. And in some mysterious way, we, we even uh, speed it up and accelerate its coming as we live out our lives for him and seek first his kingdom. And that is the beauty of the Noah story. God is our redeemer. Just as he redeemed his remnant then, he will redeem his remnant again. His plan from the beginning of time until the end is being carried out unto perfect completion. And so we can trust in the perfection of God's plan. We can trust that he is our deliverer. And as a result, we must, we must live godly, holy lives, lives that are pleasing to him. Hey, I hope this word has been an encouragement to you today. Let me pray as we close. Lord God, I, I thank you for the way that uh, you used Noah and you used his family, sparing them from the destruction of, of sin, Lord, to start a new community, to be your remnant on the earth. And Lord, just as we, we uh, read of the devastation and destruction that occurred, we thank you, Lord, that in Christ Jesus, we have found new life. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, use us in this time that we live in now to, to be your light in the world, Lord, to, to live countercultural, radical lives of faith that are for you, God, to live godly and holy lives pleasing to you, God, to live lives of worship that, uh, that move your heart as we find ourselves regularly in your presence. God, I, I thank you for the picture that the Noah story has given us of what is to come. Help us to live lives that are ready for what you are doing, ready for what you are doing in the world. And Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes that, that see and, and that are ready to respond, Lord, and, and, and that are merciful towards others and that point others towards you, Lord, knowing that you desire for none to perish, but for all to be saved. And God, I pray for every person here listening uh, to this message today, Lord, that this week they would find favor in your sight. Lord, just as Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, Lord, that this week they would find favor in your sight, that you would walk with them, that you would strengthen them and empower them, Lord, that your blessing would be upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, have a great week and look forward to seeing you next week. God bless. Finding a small group to get connected at ICA is easy. The best way is just to download and open the Church Center app and sign in to ICA. From there, select the menu button that says More and find the Groups button. This will take you to the Groups section where you can see all the group categories at ICA. Selecting one will show you the available groups. Choose a group to see its information, such as location and time it will meet. If you're interested, just select Request to Join, and that's it. The group leader will then get a hold of you. So, find a group and get connected today. Thank you for joining us today at ICA Online. We hope you had a great Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. As we grow, we are in need of more volunteers. So sign up today using the QR code, or by going to icasby.com volunteer, and see if there is a ministry that God might be calling you to join. Speaking of volunteers, Christmas is coming and ICA is gearing up for this year's Christmas production. If you would like to help participate in our Christmas celebration, go to our volunteer form and select Christmas production. Then choose an area you might be interested to serve. We need you, so come and join and help make Christmas 2022 our best ever. Small groups are the best way to get connected and meet people at ICA. If you are not yet part of a small group, visit our website or the Church Center app and check out what group might be right for you to join and sign up and get connected today. Giving to the ministry at ICA is easier than ever. Just scan the QR code of your mobile banking app 
or enter the account number on screen to make a transfer. Your generosity is what makes the ministry at ICA possible. If you need prayer, we want to pray together with you. Visit bit.ly forward slash ICA prayer online and let's believe God together for a breakthrough in your life. ICA online prayer service happens every Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. Check our social media on Tuesdays for the Zoom link information and gather with us to worship and pray together. ICA has services both in person and online. Our Bahasa services are at 8 a.m. and our English services are at 10 a.m. For in-person locations or online service links, check our website at www.icasby.com or visit the Church Center app. Follow ICA social media on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Spotify. There you will find important information, devotions, playlists, and interesting content and updates for you.